Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Templestowe Baptist Church's first recorded service. A little bit different to usual. Unfortunately, we can't all be together, but we can be together in spirit with this recorded service. So if you'd like to sing along at home, um, we've got some wonderful praise and worship that we're going to start with before Lee brings us the message. <laughs> 
time of worship together now.
worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. 
Excellent. Thank you, Mark and team. How good it is to sing a song, songs to the Lord. Let's have a brief moment of prayer together. Father, we do want to give you thanks. You are holy. There is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up our eyes in wonder of you, the living God. And so, Father, that's exactly what we ask today. We're going to look at um, some scripture. We're going to look at some stories to help us sense that, uh, God, you want to do mighty things in this nation of Australia. Amen. Uh, Well, today, uh, my topic is 2020 Vision Prayer, part of that series, and specifically the great south land of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to be speaking on the great south land of the Holy Spirit. Uh, The the vision of Australia and the Pacific Islands being the great south land of the Holy Spirit was first spoken over 400 years ago. So the Portuguese explorer, he said this, Let the heavens, the earth, the waters with all their creatures and all those present witness that I, Captain Pedro Ferdinand de Quiros, in the name of Jesus Christ, hoist the emblem, of the Holy Cross on which his, Jesus Christ's person, was crucified and whereon he gave his life for the ransom and remedy of all the human race on this day of Pentecost, the 14th of May, 1606. I take possession of all this part of the south as far as the pole in the name of Jesus, which from now shall be called the southern land of the Holy Ghost. And so that's, the, that's the, the earliest of this concept of Australia being the great south land of the Holy Spirit, spoken over 400 years ago. It almost sounds like a prophetic word over, over this nation, doesn't it? So as, um, as he proclaims this, one of the places he stood where he proclaimed it was the shores of Vanuatu, and he'd seen the, the massive coastline of Australia, and of course believed that he'd, he'd discovered this huge south land, and he wanted to claim it for Christ and even call it the great south land of the Holy Ghost. You know, um, I, I've heard that phrase many times and at many different conferences. One, one that actually still uh, stays with me was um, a conference in two, the year 2000. And it was at uh, C3 Church, Oxford Falls. That's um, a movement that Phil Pringle started. That's his, the mother church, the home church. And uh, they were hosting a conference. And as Phil was about to introduce the keynote speaker... He, he, he said these words, he said, you know, because they, they had a big theme that night of, of the great south land of the Holy Spirit. And he said, um, you know, I sometimes think that perhaps we've been a, a little premature in calling Australia the great south land of the Holy Spirit. And he, he just paused for a moment and then he said, but the reality is there's power in the prophetic word in speaking things into reality that do not yet exist, but speaking them into reality. And he went on, he talked about that for a little bit. And I think that's the power of, of, of people who, who make that claim, make that, 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 uh, that, that claim of this nation being the great south land of the Holy Spirit. Um, you know, God did actually establish some very strong Christian foundations throughout the history of this nation. For instance, if um, you think of the, the early prime ministers, the first one, Edmund Barton. Now, um, he was our first prime minister, but the interesting thing is, you may not know this about him, but it was actually his pastor who encouraged him to go into the ministry. Um, But not the ministry of preaching the word, but the ministry of being a minister of the the, the government. Encouraged him to be the prime minister and said, look, with your great gifts, uh, with with your moral integrity and the fact that you're a committed Christian, you would make the right person to be our first prime minister. So he ended up, that's exactly what happened. The second prime minister, Alfred Deacon, now, our deacon, uh, he was uh, also a committed Christian. He was one of the co-authors of the nation's first constitution. He spent many hours, and this is really interesting, he spent many hours in prayer, and I'll quote, to get the mind of God for the precise wording, humbly relying on the blessing of the Almighty. Isn't that interesting? So on in the formation of Australia's first constitution, we have the second prime minister, praying deeply into this, wanting to know the mind of God, wanting to get the words just right. Our nation over the years has had, actually had many Christian politicians and many Christian leaders, and some of those men witnessed great revivals in our nation. 
Another one who prophesied about this nation uh, being the great south land of the Holy Spirit and seeing a mighty revival was a chap called Smith Wigglesworth. Now, he's a healing evangelist. Um, now, um, Pentecostals usually know who this guy is. Sometimes evangelicals don't. Uh, Smith Wigglesworth um, was uh, a well-known evangelist in the, uh, the early 1900s, and uh, God used him mightily. And uh, he prophesied that Australia would become the great south land of the Holy Spirit, and that before the Lord's return, Australia would experience the mightiest revival the world had ever seen. Quite a statement, isn't it? Uh, now, you might say, well, why would we take any notice of this guy? Well, let me tell you a little bit about his life. So uh, Smith Wigglesworth grew up in very humble circumstances. In fact, uh, he he received virtually no education. He became a plumber and uh, was always pretty good with money, but it was not at all an educated man and uh, pretty rough around the edges and not the sort of person who in his younger years you would ever think would have become a preacher. He had it tough as a little kid. Um, You know, parents didn't have much money. And so even as a little boy before school years, he actually had to go out to work. And he'd earn a little bit of money pulling up root vegetables for farmers. And then by the age of seven, he was working six days a week where his dad worked at the mill and actually earning pretty good money. He must have been a hard worker for a little seven-year-old. Uh, and so this is his background. So no, no time for education. He had to help the family financially. Well, as a young adult, he said of himself that, uh, first of all, he was uh, christened in the Anglican church. He got saved in the Methodist church. And, uh, and the church he started to attend as a young adult was the Salvation Army. Uh, the Salvation Army, the Ar- Army at the time, I mean, it, was a, it was an active, happening church. You know, it's the new thing, and uh, it attracted huge numbers of young people, many people getting saved through that movement. And Smithy enjoyed the services there. They were very vibrant. But also, uh, the, the local Salvation Army had a girl that he'd taken notice of, Polly. Uh, very pretty. And Polly was a, a very gifted, upfront speaker type of person. And so she would preach on Sundays quite often. And also uh, the Salvos at the time, they had an evangelistic approach where they'd, they'd use their brass band. Brass bands at that time were actually the cool sound. That was the, the sound that was in at the time. And they'd set up their brass band on a, on a corner of a pavement, that sort of thing. They'd gather a crowd with the band and then people would stand up and testify or preach. Well, Polly was one of those people. You know, she'd stand up on a, a, a chair or a little box and she'd preach the Word of God. And people there and then would give their lives to Christ, right on the roadside, come and kneel at the curb and she'd, she'd um, pray for them and bring them to faith in Jesus. Well, Smithy thought she was fantastic. They got to know each other, fell in love and got married. Um, she would sometimes encourage Smithy to have a go at preaching. And he'd kind of get up at the, at the pulpit to share perhaps a, a brief word and uh, he'd stutter and he'd stammer, feel embarrassed and get down within two or three minutes. And uh, she tried to do that with him a few times until he said, look, I'm, not, I'm clearly, uh, you know, I have, I have a speech impediment. You know, I'm not the right person to be at a pulpit. And uh, so, you know, that, that didn't happen anymore. He had many creative ways, though, that he would lead people to Christ. He was good with little kids. He got a whole string of ponies and he'd have these little kids on these ponies saying, have a pony ride if I can take you to church and uh, you can have a pony ride back home as well <laughs> if, if, you go, if you stay through the whole service. And he reached families through, through clever little things like that. A uh, good organiser, but a behind the scenes sort of man. Well, anyway, there was a, a travelling healing evangelist came to England and uh, spoke in uh, the churches of their region. And anyway, Smithy went along to some of his meetings And the guy was leading people to Christ, but also, Smithy had never seen this before, sick people were coming, this guy would pray for them, and in some cases they were instantaneously, miraculously healed. Smithy was blown away. He's going out in the streets, dragging anyone who was was sick, saying, come to the meetings, you'll get healed, you'll get healed, mate, you'll get healed. And (laughs) he brought them in, and some of them did get healed. Well, this um, this travelling evangelist also, one of the things he did was he called people forward to prayer as well, for receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit or to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And a bunch of people came forward and Smithy himself, he he came forward, Smith Wigglesworth. And this guy prayed for Smithy amongst others and Smithy was impacted, deeply, deeply impacted. The Holy Spirit came upon him in a mighty way. He says to Polly in the next couple of days, his wife, I see you're rostered to preach this Sunday. Can I preach? And uh, well... (laughs) Uh, sure, yeah, she was, she, was, um, she was surprised, but she was, she was pleased. She was going to have another crack at it. Stood up at the pulpit. And the first two or three minutes, the same thing happened. He kind of stuttered and stammered a bit. But after that two or three minutes, suddenly everything changed. 
And it's just like, he just preached. It was like a different person. Very articulate, very powerful. And from that point on, suddenly God, through the, the power of God's spirit, he had suddenly lifted Smithy into a different place. And preaching was something he could suddenly do and do it really well. Well, he's developed a ministry in this. So he's, he's traveling around England, preaching in all sorts of different places. And uh, God's using him mightily. People are coming to faith in Christ. Well, this ministry kept on expanding. It started in Great, Great Britain, but then expanded beyond until ultimately, really, it was all over the world. And in fact, he came to Australia twice as well in the 1920s. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about his Australian visit. As he arrives in Australia, um, you know, he's... Uh, he immediately attracted a crowd, which again tells us he must have been pretty well known. One of the biggest venues Melbourne had at the time was the Olympia, 7,000 seats. Well, Smithy had no problem packing that out. And uh, Smithy would, was known as a healing evangelist. And so he would he'd share the gospel, people would get saved, but he would also pray for the sick. And extraordinary numbers of people would get healed. Um, if you're thinking, well, some of these old stories, are they kind of exaggerated? Well, let me take you right back to the source. So I'm going to quote to you now from the newspaper of the day. This is the Argos newspaper, 23rd of February, 1922, was um, when this was issued. And uh, it was the most read newspaper in Melbourne. Here's the article, Healing by Touch. It was also a conservative newspaper. Further demonstrations of healing by touch were given by Mr. Smith Wigglesworth, the Yorkshire evangelist, before a very large assembly at the Olympia last night. After the evangelist had given an address on the subject of faith, he called upon those who had come forward on Tuesday night to testify as to the results. And several persons who had been suffering from deafness, rheumatics and lameness declared that their ailments had, been complete, had, had completely gone. Mr. Wigglesworth then gave further manifestations healing, of healing by touch. An elderly man that he'd that had been deaf for years, cried joyfully, Hallelujah, Hallelujah, when asked by Smith Wigglesworth if he could hear after his hands had been placed on him and he'd been prayed over. A woman, who it was declared had had stiffness for 20 years, who limped on the arm of a relative to the Olympia, ran about the hall with joy after having been touched. And these sort of articles at the time, this is just a secular mainstream newspaper, as I said, the, the biggest selling one in Melbourne at the time, those articles about the meetings were printed all the time. All manner of extraordinary healings and wonderful conversions where people's lives were totally turned around. Uh, it, was, it was a great move of God. And he was just here for um, two and a half, three weeks or so. But a good thousand people had given their lives to Christ from all sorts of backgrounds and dozens of people were healed. In fact, on one of the evenings, so many people had come forward to be prayed for for healing. He said, this, I can't pray for this many people in the one night. Why don't we make an afternoon? Um, and they, they set a time and 700 people turned up just to be, to be prayed for for healing. Some obviously sometimes being brought by other people, but that was the number. And Smithy went through and prayed for every single one of them. And some of them were miraculously healed. Uh, wonderful stories. Let me tell you this story about one particular girl. So she came to one of the evening sessions and she begged her parents to take her. She's a young adult, but um, she had consumption or tuberculosis, as many of you will be aware, at that time, tuberculosis was uh, really a dreaded disease to get. I remember my grandmother, my mother telling me about my grandmother in the 1940s, I think it was. She twice had TB and was in hospital for weeks, nearly died. Uh, so a terrible thing to get. Well, this, this young lady, she had a severe case of it. Uh, she was just skin and bones. In fact, her skin was all flaky and covered in sores. She looked gaunt, very, very skinny. And um, she, had not, she could not eat. So even a little morsel of food would make her absolutely dry reach. And you know, she'd just end up throwing it up. Um, so despite the fact the parents did not want to take her, thought it was a waste of time. Why would you go to a ridiculous meeting like that? Nothing is going to happen. She kept insisting enough to eventually they brought her one night. So she was taken forward for prayer and eventually Smithy got to her and prayed for her. Well, she was prayed for and after she was prayed for, she felt all the symptoms of tuberculosis just left her. She went home that night and she ate a hearty meal despite all the, the, the parents and relatives saying, don't do that, you're going to be so sick. She scoffed down a ton of food, then they unwrapped the bandages and all of her skin was healed. It was like that of a newborn baby. Now, from here, this, this young lady, she ended up doing some great ministry for God here in Melbourne. She ended up setting up a, like a, a food 
soup kitchen type of setup for the poor and the gospel was communicated through that all the time many many people were saved it was it was a big outfit and uh, she became a tremendous christian leader in the community as did a whole number of smith wigglesworth converts at that time and wigglesworth one of the things he would say i know i've mentioned a fair bit about the healing but one of the things he would say is really what it was all about for him was making disciples of 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 the gospel of jesus christ going out so the disciples would be made. It was always about people coming to believe in Jesus. Now remember what this guy said. Now you know a little bit about him. Let me read it again. He prophesied that this nation would become the great Southland of the Holy Spirit and would experience the mightiest revival that the world had ever seen. Let's turn to the scriptures for a moment. Be reminded of uh, Jesus' words here, Acts 1, 7. He said to them, It is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. And we won't know if that prophecy comes true. We don't know when this nation will experience the mightiest revival that has ever been seen. Um, But Jesus adds, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, he says to his disciples, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And after this, um, he said, he was, rather, and after he'd said this, he was taken up before their very eyes in a cloud, and it hid him, hid him from their sight. And so here's Jesus, that's Jesus' ascension. And so, you know, he shares those final words with the disciples. You know, you need to, you need to be ready to share my gospel in great power, but you must wait for the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And, uh, and then he ascends into heaven. Well, this is what the apostles ended up doing. One twelve, it says, Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those presents were, were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the, the, the zealot, and Judas, the son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women, And Mary, the mother of Jesus, was with his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. So you got the idea. There's about 120 people gathered, and they gathered. Why? Because Jesus instructed them to go to Jerusalem and to pray, awaiting the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, is that something we still to do today? Do, you know, do we ask to be filled with the Spirit today? Do we wait upon the Holy Spirit and ask to be filled? Is that a, a, a reasonable thing to do, or is that a kind of only for that time? Well, let me quote to you uh, from the, uh, the uh, director of the Baptist Seminary in Sydney. His name is Mr. Morland, and he's a contemporary of Smith Wigglesworth. In 1942... This is what he writes in his diary about being filled with the Spirit. He writes, I must be filled with the Holy Spirit. I cannot lead my life without his fullness. I may be filled. The promise is for me. I would be filled. That is the point reached. I shall be filled. So this is a principle of the Baptist Theological College. And um, actually, ultimately, Mr. Morland, the college is now named after him. And so clearly he believed that, yes, we should be praying to be filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, he used to teach his students this, that um, you could not be effective at sharing the gospel unless you were empowered by God's Spirit. Well, what do we see in the Bible? Well, actually, that pattern makes sense. Because shortly after the Holy Spirit descends in power, look what happens. Acts 2.38. Peter replied, he's out there preaching now, he's been filled with the Spirit. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off and for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. You can see something of how God has empowered this man as an evangelist um, after the Holy Spirit descended. Now, if we've got a heart to see the Holy Spirit move in great power in this nation of Australia, a heart to see this become the great Southland of the Holy Spirit, there are often 
prerequisites before promises or premises before promises. Let's have a look at a verse that, that indeed speaks in that way. It's one that's often claimed for revival. Second Chronicles 7.14. It says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sin, and I will heal their land. In 1902, that was the verse that was claimed for a revival right here in Melbourne. A wonderful move of God. And that, that verse had been prayed into and claimed and people were trying to live it out for a, a good couple of years before the reality came. And R.A. Torrey came over and there was a mighty revival here in Melbourne. Two years later, that verse was used in the Welsh revival, a wonderful revival. There was 100,000 people, 100, people saved in just a matter of months. And the whole nation of Wales became completely different. Crime rates were so low, police had nothing to do. They would come and usher in prayer meetings. Uh, magistrates had nothing to do. There was no serious crime and they were given a white glove as a symbol of, well, there, there is no crime. It was an amazing move of God. And that scripture was the one used again. In fact, the key, the key person who was used in that particular revival, Evan Roberts, one of the interesting things is he had, uh, sometime before this, he'd taken his big chunky Bible down the mine where he worked and it was opened on that very page, Second Chronicles. And there was an explosion in the mine. Fortunately, no one was hurt. But after the explosion, it looked like the, the, like the scorch marks around that particular scripture looked like the very fingerprints of God. It was from that point that Evan Roberts started claiming that scripture. Perhaps it's a scripture we should claim and live out for this nation of Australia. Let's break it up. It actually has four premises in it before we get the wonderful promises. It starts by saying, if my people who are called by my name. So that's clearly referring to Christians, isn't it? Um, they're people called by his name or, or is the believers in the one true God. So it's, uh, and any revival actually starts with believers. It may not start in a church, but it starts with believers and then spreads to the community. It goes on to say, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. If they will humble themselves. Now I wonder what that means, to humble ourselves. It's not a word we use that often today, is it? Humble ourselves. You know, it's um, someone I've read quite a bit is the late Selwyn Hughes. He writes Every Day with Jesus and many other excellent books, including some excellent books on revival. He says this about uh, humbling ourselves in relation to that um, statement. I have no hesitation in saying that pride or lack of humility is the biggest single impediment to revival. Interesting comment. Um, Humility, of course, we must understand what it means. Uh, some people think, oh, you're humble if you, you put yourself down all the time. It's not actually about that, really. Um, if you look in a dictionary, humility is often defined as a sober estimate of yourself. It's not an inflated estimate, it's a sober estimate. But it's not a deflated estimate, it's an accurate picture of yourself. But in the Christian understanding of humility, it's actually an absence of self. The person who's humble, they're focused on God's kingdom. They're focused on the Lord himself. They have a different focus rather than themselves. Um, another area that um, we're told to focus on is to pray. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. We are to be a people who will pray. Um, now prayer is always at the heart of a revival. And um, at the moment, I think it's a great time to perhaps capitalize on personal prayer. Not so many uh, churches at this point meeting together. Uh, because of uh, the virus, um, but, uh, it, or not in any, any significant numbers. But what a great time to get alone with God, to capitalize on this and be, be in some quality, personal time with the Lord. You know, I'm, I regularly go to a lake to pray just to get, uh, you know, it's got a picturesque view. It's a great place to go and just focus on the Lord, try and get away and just allow Him to speak to me. But getting alone with God in prayer is important. Where there is the opportunity, gathering in prayer meetings, of course, and where there is the opportunity, interdenominational prayer events. You know, I, looking back in some of the um, prayer meetings over the years, I can still remember one that uh, our church had um, uh, chosen to do some Sunday, a series of Sunday night prayer meetings, prayer services, where we just do worship and prayer. My goodness, some of those were powerful. Amazing passion that people were praying with. But I can still remember a few of them distinctly. We were praying on a wooden floor. And um, some of those meetings, I remember we, when we left, there were literally 
puddles of tears on the floor. Some people have been so moved by God that sobbed in repentance or sobbed in desperation for revival that uh, there were literally puddles of tears on the floor. They were powerful meetings, you know, others shouting out passionate, heartfelt, powerful prayers to God. The Lord moved. Prayer is going to be key. The third area is seeking His face. If my people will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. Seek my face. I wonder what it means to, to seek God's face. Now, I, believe, I believe it's got to do with being intimate with God. Worship and adoration. Truly trying to seek to be intimate, close. As if we are right before the very throne of God. There was a revival uh, broke out in uh, Melbourne in 1925 and it was heavily influenced by this concept of seeking God's face. An American preacher, Alfred Valdez, he'd arrived in Australia and uh, he, he was just here seeking God's face saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to go? It is my place to be here and seek the living God, to seek your face, Lord, and you tell me what you want me to do. And uh, well, anyway, the Lord put in his heart that he needed to go to Sunshine. He'd never heard of Sunshine before. Didn't know where it was. Didn't know if it was a real place. But they just got that word. And anyway, so he did a bit of research, found where Sunshine was it's in, in the suburbs of um, Melbourne these days, uh, inner city suburb area. And uh, so he, he goes to Sunshine, immediately meets a guy there who runs a church. And he said, absolutely, why don't we start some meetings? And so for about four evenings of the week, they ran evangelistic meetings and prayer meetings. And extraordinarily, God was obviously in all of this because the numbers just started to come. God's Spirit moved in tremendous power. And they kept moving from one venue to another. Their third venue was 1,200 seats, a theatre in Richmond. By the way, this, that ultimately, that's the beginnings of the very large um, AOG church in Richmond. This is its early foundations. But the revival was wonderful. God was doing a remarkable work. People were seeking the Lord's face. And so they were coming from all over the city. And people, to give you an idea of just how hungry they were for God, they're on the trains coming to Sunshine and they're not quietly reading their Bibles. They are singing songs of praise to the tops of their voices on the trains, shouting out prayers. Other passengers there thinking, oh my goodness, who are these weird people? But the trains were packed with people like this. And so often people who were not on the trains to go to those particular meetings were getting saved or were convinced that they needed to go to the meetings. Well, the meetings were packed. Night after night, God did an amazing localized revival in the Sunshine area. Wonderful move of God. Started with people seeking His face. One more. Perhaps the most challenging one. We need to humble ourselves. We need to turn. Oh, sorry, we need to pray. We need to seek His face. And we need to turn from wicked ways. Turn from their wicked ways. The Lord inspires the author to write. Now, immediately, I'm sure you're thinking to yourself, oh, but, but Lee, I don't have any wicked ways. What are you talking about? I don't have wicked ways. Well, you know, it's, um, it's all of us need to consider the, the area of holiness. What does it really mean to be holy? That's really what it's, it's challenging us about, that passage. Turn from their wicked ways. If my people will turn from their wicked ways, if we would choose to live a holy life. Selwyn Hughes in his book Revival, Times of Refreshing, one of my favourite books of his, um, he challenges about this very area. And uh, one of the things he does is he, he gives us a list. It's quite an extensive list, a very challenging list. And he says at the beginning, you know, just be careful with this list. I'm not trying to make people feel condemned. You know, it's not about that. But I just wanted to explore what does it mean to be holy? What does it mean to turn from wicked ways? What does it mean to really live that life that God desires? And so he writes this list. Let me read some, some, of, some from this list. It starts off like this. How long is it since I became a Christian? All sorts of questions to ask ourselves. How long is it since I became a Christian? Have I grown steadily in that time? Was I ever further forward than I am now? Uh, can I measure a degree of steady progress in my spiritual understanding? I wonder how much of my life is left, my life, meaning we're supposed to give our life to the Lord. How much are we holding on to, in other words? Is my reading of Scripture a mere duty or is it a delight 
Am I deeply conscious of the need for more private and corporate prayer? Do I think more about a larger income than I do about my spiritual development? Do I live day by day in conscious dependence on the Lord? Does the need for revival have much place in my prayer life? Have I hurt or wounded anyone and not yet apologised? How much time have I given in the past to equating myself with the history of revival? How much time am I prepared to give in the future? Do I give myself to God and then draw back when I realise just how much is involved? How do I feel about undertaking this spiritual checkup? Challenged? <clears throat> Bored? Unconcerned? Do I grieve when I hear the name of Jesus Christ blasphemed or have I grown insensitive to such things? When my non-Christian friends ask me about my interests, do I take the opportunity to share Christ? Am I fighting a losing battle with evil thoughts? When did I last undertake a spiritual fast? <laughs> if I was arrested for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict me? Am I a faithful steward of the money that flows through my hands? Do I give at least one-tenth of my income to God? What do other members of my family think about my Christian life at home? Does my, conscious, uh, does my conscience function in the way God designed it by objecting to evil and approving good? Do I watch degrading films in the cinema or on television? Have I debts which are outstanding and well overdue? Am I honest in relation to my employer, giving my whole energy to my responsibilities and remembering that I'm not employed by an earthly employer, but by God? Am I eager for revival? And I know in his book he says that actually being eager for revival is a sign of spiritual passion. People who are hungry for a move of God, they're hungry for revival, it's because there's passion in their hearts for the one true God. Now he adds, you know, about this, um, this list. He says, look, we're saved by grace and only by grace and the work of Jesus on the cross. I don't want you to feel condemned from the list. But sometimes I think we need a spiritual checkup. How are we really doing? Do we have ways to turn from? The promise comes in the second part of Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 7.14. Then, if we live out those truths, you know, if we, if we humble ourselves, if we pray, if we... If we seek his face, we turn from our wicked ways. He says, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. Three prom promises there within that verse. Great thing to pray for our nation of Australia. Look at this verse here in Luke eleven thirteen. Jesus speaking, he says, So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? All of us fall short of God's standard, and yet parents know how to give good gifts to their children. And then God is saying, you know, how much more? Jesus is saying, how much more will God the Father give good gifts to those who ask him, including the gift of the Holy Spirit. If we want this nation to be the great south land of the Holy Spirit, it is a case of asking. And Jesus there is encouraging us. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? You know, may Australia truly become the great south land of the Holy Spirit. Shall we pray together? Father, here today is... Um, We've explored the reality of uh, the prophetic word about Australia being the great south land of the Holy Spirit. As we've thought about scriptures and our response and what could we do personally to position our own lives where we could be used of God to, to see the Holy Spirit move in power. Father, we want to pray that your word would remain in our hearts. You might move amongst us. You might have your way. Lord, we ask in the holy name of Jesus that one day, the prophecies we've, we've been looking at might come true, that indeed this nation of Australia would become the great Southland of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Thank you, Pastor Lee. If you'd like to stay with us, we're going to finish with one final song, The Great Southland. This is our nation, this is our land, this is our future, this is our home, a land of reaping, a land of harvest, this is our land, this is our home. This is the great Southland of the Holy Spirit. This is a baptized place and summer rains to the sunburned land. We will see a flood to this great Southland. The Spirit comes. This is our nation, this is our land, of plenty, this land of hope, the richest harvest is in a people's we see revival, his spirit. recorded TBC uh, recorded service um, I hope that we'll see you again next time